Thank you very much, Kirk. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Uh, good day, everyone. My name's Kirk Nichols. Uh, a little bit of forewarning through my presentation. I'm going to ask for some hand raising, but I think the crowd's been pretty good about that so far, so I don't think that's an issue. And to let you know that my talk today is about uh, incident response exercises and how to go through them and develop your team. The focus of this is for team leaders, incident responders, but also if you're running a security program in your organization and you're trying to uh, improve organizational maturity or you're trying to measure where you're currently at so you can make a case for improving things. This is going to be quite uh, simple and a quick rush through different kinds of concepts in running an incident response exercise program. But uh, if you want to talk to me over the next three days, I'll absolutely be available to dive into anything deeper. So here's my credentials. For the past 10 years or more, I've been a dungeon master for various kinds of role-playing games on the tabletop. I used to play in games for an extended period of time, but I found out I was very jumpy when it came to wanting to create new characters. The solution to this was to just run games, then I get to play hundreds of characters at the same time and keep track of them, and that kept my brain very happy. But in the few instances where I'm actually playing, uh, I usually end up playing beautiful idiots like this guy who'll give anything a red-hot go and uh, try and inspire the party and everyone around them to jump in. Lately, the kind of games that I've been playing are weird little smaller games rather than the big Dungeons & Dragons games you may all be familiar with. On the left-hand side is a game called Boy Problems. It's a Carly Rae Jepsen-themed uh, heist game where you go and try and break into a vault where 200 unreleased Carly Rae Jepsen songs are stored. Uh, the game on the right-hand side... The uh, game on the right-hand side is about settling down after a long adventuring career and dealing with uh, putting the past to bed, settling into a community, and uh, putting away the traumas of the past. So you can tell I'm a little bit outside of uh, the uh, big Hollywood blockbuster games when I like to run things. So the other part of my credentials are that I've been working for, I was working for the Air Force for the past 10 years, and what I spent a lot of that time doing was uh, helping pre-deployment exercises, and in particular, uh, working with the Combat Survival School. So the Combat Survival School for Air Force is the part of Air Force that trains pilots in how to survive and deal with the situation of their plane having crashed in unfriendly territory and how to get themselves out of that situation effectively. So what you'll see here on the left-hand side is a picture of me completing my last university paper and on the right, me submitting it. So this is all to say that my career in IT and my career through academia is a little bit different from what some of you may have experienced. Uh, this submission took me from uh, base camp, where I had to four-wheel drive out of a black zone up to the top of a hill, and then I had to tether my phone in the one spot that I knew had, had uh, phone reception on this testing range to submit my assignment. So now I've managed to leave Air Force and actually have a career running games, which I never thought would be something I could actually achieve without going into tabletop board game industries or something like that. I got an opportunity to go and work for TSS Cyber, and I mostly work over here on the left-hand side of this uh, corporate character sheet, doing incident response exercises, security reviews, and talking through what can go wrong. I get to catastrophize for a living. It's brilliant. So what can you expect out of me over the course of the next 16 minutes? We'll talk about a bit of a definition of incident response. Because of my history, it's probably a little bit weirder and a bit different than people who've worked in ICT exclusively. Why bother practicing incident response? go through a few different approaches and different applications for incident response drills, how to do it well, some recommended reading, and then a handout. So you get both homework and a takeaway from me. So what is incident response? And for that matter, what is an exercise? As I said, I've had a bit of a different experience. I uh, worked for Combat Survival School for a long time. And if you think about the uh, situation you may find yourself in if you're a pilot crashing behind enemy lines or just in generally unfriendly or un, uh, unsupportive territory, that could be thought of as an incident. A circumstance occurs that you weren't anticipating. It's not a circumstance that you want to be in, but you want to get out of it. So what do you need to do that? Ideally, you would have prepared and resourced yourself for that. You would have done some training and thought about it ahead of time to work out the best way to move yourself from the bad place to the good place. On that, there's these two concepts that I picked up in the military that I've heard a little bit around in uh, the wider community of capability and preparedness. And you don't need to understand them in depth or read a lot about them. It's just, is your organization or are you capable of executing upon something? Cool, you have the resources, you have the people, you have the skills, that's, that's okay. But are you actually prepared to do that? Do you have the time available to you? Can you actually whip that up on short notice? How quickly can you take it away? So how many people here have been in an incident response situation before? Cool. How many people have been in a fire drill before? Yeah, great. 
So I asked this and I put this up because I would say that a fire drill is an excellent example of an incident response exercise. Something you don't want to have happen is happening. The building's on fire, at least you suspect it to be. Your uh, detection mechanisms have triggered off, told you the thing is happening, and things, and, uh, things are set into motion to deal with that situation. You have a bunch of people who are trained in how to respond to it. People understand where they need to go and what they need to do under those circumstances. There's even snazzy uniforms and equipment to go along with it. On the uh, right-hand side there is a great example of a kind of an incident response exercise where you can move from the nice, calm version of things where people proceed their way out of the building and get to the safe spot. Good job, everyone. Round of applause, back to work. With a little bit of extra equipment, you can do that extra level of immersion, higher level of technical training, and uh, give people that opportunity to see what they would do in a slightly more stressful situation. So why do we prepare for incidents? Why is it important? Well, you don't want to end up like this guy during an incident. He's obviously got somewhere much, much better to be while everyone else is calmly filing out of the building. Maybe it's that he's had too many cups of those coffees. I don't know what it is, but he's definitely not doing what everyone else is doing. He must have missed the rehearsals. So we're all highly trained professionals. We're all highly capable. We know how to do things, how to solve problems. We've got the best playbooks. Everything's written up. Why would we need to practice for the impossible circumstances that are there? Why would we need to manage those things? So the way the military thinks about this is not that you are, as an individual, not very good at your job, but that there is a risk that you may not be able to successfully complete that job under pressure when things are going sideways. Stress mounts up on all of us and causes us to uh, create errors and to do things improperly in the course of our work. And during an incident, that's doubly so. So if individually we all feel quite competent, are we competent in operating that way as a team under crisis? That's the other question. Are there other organizations that we can look to, other industries that we can take lessons from that may focus on practice and repeatability? So this is my football team from up in North Queensland, the Queensland Cowboys. They're my team and it's my dream to see them at the top. Hi, Mum. Um, so sports teams are a great example of a high performance operation that really favor preparation before game day. Uh, they go through a feeder program of taking junior members into the organization. They invest a lot into finding the best people, to investing the skills into them, and to ultimately getting the cup on game day. So there's a little bit of academia I want to go through to explain some of the stress mechanisms and a few of the other learning mechanisms for going through the next portion. Uh, I promise this will be quite quick. So a lot of you may have heard of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's probably the most common thing you'll hear out of that guy. This is a bit of other work that he did. He talks about the basic levels of understanding a concept and uh, what you can do with it once you become more advanced. But the important thing to consider with this is what is the difference between having juniors and seniors in your team or principals? Um, adopting this language of a professional environment, but I'm sure your organization may have uh, your own language that you use for different levels of uh, capability in your organization. And I would argue that the difference between a junior, a senior, and a more, and a more uh, principal level person is that they are able to dynamically evaluate the information that they already know and creatively reapply it. So how do you get a junior and make them a senior and make them a principal? Well, they need a diversity of experience so that they can get to this analyze and evaluate point. They need a diversity of perspectives and opportunities to see things unfold in different ways before they can make these complex uh, assessments and apply to dynamic uh, situations as they're unfolding. So this study in, uh, in brief basically talks about the point that once you become stressed out, you tend to dump information out of your brain pretty quickly, unless you're used to dealing with that situation. So practicing beforehand allows you to uh, react better during a crisis situation. One of the most effective ways besides this to deal with the effects of stress on memory is to have exposure to similar kinds of circumstances. One of the kinds of stress reactions that we have is that we are in an utterly unfamiliar circumstance. So going back to the previous example where we have seniors who have been exposed to a variety of different uh, industries, different kinds of problems, they can tend to refer to an experience they have that is similar to what they're currently seeing and extrapolate and synthesize an answer from that. But if you've never seen anything like what you're currently confronting, it's very hard to find a solution and see a way forward. So this is the very unacademic part of it. 
uh, and is just a way of me explaining different kinds of experience and ways that you can bestow experience and understanding on the more junior members of your organization or the members of your organization that don't have your specific technical understanding and passing that on to them. So the first one is personal experience. And from a team leader's point of view, I just wanted to make sure that this was in there. If you're relying on people in your team knowing what they're supposed to be doing and having the skills and exposure and experience necessary to effectively respond to situations and to deal with the problems that they're confronting, you're in for a rough time. If you're trusting that there's going to be a common sense, if you're trusting that there's going to be an assumed level of knowledge without validating that, you are not doing your job effectively as a team leader. So you need to check in on this. And that's why relying on this is not a great, is not a great way forward. The other thing to consider is that personal experience is a huge equity problem. If you're depending on people having these experiences themselves or seeking them out themselves, you're putting all the onus on them, and they may not have access to all the opportunities of their peers. A previous boss of mine had this picture on her wall. She was a systems engineer in the aviation world. And it's by this uh, other fellow named Abraham. There's only two Abrahams in this talk. Uh, it's about logical errors in uh, analysis. And what was happening with this image was uh, that the uh, English Air Force was doing an analysis of uh, planes as they were returning from combat zones. And they found this is, where this is where aircraft are getting shot through. A team of analysts looked at it and how can we improve the aircraft to make them more resilient to this type of fire? And the conclusion they arrived at by looking at that was that they should place armor on all the parts of the plane that were most commonly hit. Now, the issue with that is that these were the planes that came back. The planes that crashed were the ones that were fatally struck. So these ones all had non-fatal shots. These places are fine continuing and not being armored. And the point I want to make with this is that your proximity to the problem and your ability to analyze through personal experience or being very close to something doesn't always lead you to the correct conclusions. So it is valuable to get external validation and external checkups from things. So, what do we do? We look at other people's experience. I mean, it's slightly less risky, but it still puts work on you. You still need to go out and perform that analysis. It's still opportunistic and still carries with it a lot of those equity problems, but there we go. Um, it is a reliable way that you can get information into other people's brains consistently because you can provide them with opportunities uh, such as reading. So this is a response by General James Mattis, who was one of the uh, United States Marines generals, responding to a junior officer saying that they did not have time to do professional reading and professional development in preparing themselves for the next stages of their career. And the general basically responds and says, no, I, I wouldn't have gotten where I got to without reading everything and preparing myself for the impossible number of circumstances I confronted. Reading through history gave me the benefit of all of those people's knowledge so that I could confront very scary situations. So staying on the theme of the military stuff, the military has this social mechanism internally called, called telling war stories. And what it is, within the Australian military at least, is a way of transferring knowledge between more senior people who have been exposed to situations to more junior people. You get to tell them about an extraordinary circumstance that you were a part of, and they gain the benefit of that wisdom so that then they can take it away, and if they find themselves in a similar place, they can then apply that and use that as a point of reference for addressing that problem themselves. Now, the important thing to consider culturally with war stories, if you're going to be promoting them in your organization, is that they should be about benefiting the more junior person and giving them the benefit of your knowledge and experience. It's not about big noting yourself. So mentoring and coaching puts a bit more of a structure around this telling of war stories and passing on of knowledge from person to person. And there are loads of books and frameworks out there that you can, you can look at. And it's a way for seniors to formally contribute to the next generation. Can I see a show of hands from people who have a formal mentoring or coaching relationship in their professional life? OK, so we're about, a th about what, a quarter of the room? I'd like to see a lot more, but that's OK. But again, there's a bias and an equity problem. You need to make sure that the mentor and coach has a sensible way of approaching that relationship, that the mentee knows how to ask questions, and that, from the mentor's point of view, they understand what they need to do to help the person, not what they think that person needs, but to actually properly understand that person in full. So you've got all these different kinds of models that you can potentially use. Things that will draw out questions from your uh, staff members and bring information to the fore and allow you to better understand what the problems they're facing are, ways to set goals for them, ways to check in and provide them with that guidance and support. 
So all of these are publicly available resources and they'll be in the slides. Don't feel terribly like you need to take photos. So onto the synthetic experiences. Uh, these require investment, but are the most controls, and it's kind of like science. So we'll all remember from high school science that we want to set up a controlled laboratory environment where we control the variables as much as possible and expose uh, people or processes to the situation contained within. On the left-hand side, you'll see on the, at the top, you'll see two examples of what I would say would be incident response uh, synthetic experiences. They're both escape rooms. You could probably find a bunch of them here in Wellington. You go inside, they're pre-set up with a bunch of problems you need to solve in order to escape that environment, and uh, you are scored or monitored throughout that with your results being explained to you afterwards. Down on the bottom left, there's an example of an Air Force officer using a virtualized environment to expose themselves to new technology prior to actually having that technology physically available to them. So you can work with prototypes and machinery and things like that without actually having access to those things. Or if those environments would be high risk, you can approach them in a virtualized environment prior to doing it physically. Over on the right, who's familiar with Portal in this, in this room? Oh, good, I knew I was at the right conference. So, Virtualized environments can take it one step further and actually allow you to try and solve problems and work in environments where the laws of physics may not normally allow you to. So it's, a, so it's good to consider that if you can't physically construct the environments you can work in, you can construct environments that just flat out allow you to break the laws of reality or the laws of uh, computing as they currently exist. So using incident response exercises as testing. We've talked a bit about how and why you could use these as an opportunity to expose people to experiences. But we'll talk a bit now about how we can use them as an opportunity to test people, but more importantly, the incident response process and team overall. So I like the, uh, the metaphor that I learned in my recent reverse engineering class of static and dynamic analysis. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, but static analysis is about looking laboriously at a code as it sits uh, in, an, in an inert state and being quite deliberate about the way you look through it. It's, resource intensive in the way that it's executed in most cases, but will give you an excellent understanding of the, uh, of the code as it exists. Dynamic, dynamic analysis involves observing uh, SIPs, uh, systems under stimulus. So you watch something as it interacts with the actual environment and you make observations and inferences about the state of that environment. The important thing here is that this is much more relevant than static analysis when you start including humans who will make uh, different decisions depending on how prescriptive your environment and the uh, incident response systems you have in place are. As with a lot of things, the answer can lie somewhere in the middle. If you're doing an incident response test of, uh, of an organization, you both want to do a static analysis of all the documentation and how the organization thinks about itself on paper and then perform a dynamic, dynamic analysis by throwing it into a crisis situation because you may, may find that things start behaving out of the expected bounds that you present them with. So, how do we do it well? Measurement and improvement is probably the biggest uh, important part of your incident response process. You want to define what you're actually trying to achieve, what a good outcome looks like, what uh, success and not success looks like, and define that across multiple, uh, multiple axes. It's a whole science. Measurement's hard. You're not going to get it right the first time you do it, and this is why I recommend making your incident response exercise program a cyclical thing where you will get feedback and you'll go back and you'll do it again and again and adjust, adjust your measures. As with your high school science experiments, you'll find that the outcomes that you measured weren't the ones you actually needed to measure. Once you've run the experiment once or twice, you can go back and adjust it. That's fine. So you've got to make it engaging. You've got to find out what your audience cares about and make sure you present them with that information, both in the, both, both in the scenario effectively, but also with other handouts. And you may need to put additional stimulus and additional excitement in there. So there is a bit of stagecraft and a bit of theater to this. So who, who was a theater kid through high school? Anyone in this drama? Wow, OK, that's cool. That's more than the coaching people. That's nice. <laughs> um, so one of the things we can consider in a concept that we should be familiar with as IT people is the idea of abstraction. You want to look at the level of information you're presenting in your incident response exercise and work out the level of abstraction you want to present. If you have lots of uh, exec leadership team, if you have your public relations people and your law team in there, you probably don't want to be presenting them with bytecode, for example. You pick the level of abstraction that works for you and you factor that into your measurement and your expectations. A developer friend of mine made me put this caveat in here that all abstractions are leaky and that there is a trade-off. If you put abstractions in, people may be missing the point in parts of their incident response testing and familiarization. So 
one of the things the Center for Disease Control in America takes care of is the uh, proliferation of bug out bags in the community. These are bags that have 24 to 72 hours worth of resources in them and help people become more resilient during circumstances of fire, flood, earthquake, etc. And they found out there was an unacceptably low level of uptake of their bug out bags throughout the community. So some clever chook in amongst their comms team said, well, look, I've got an idea. Can I put out this zombie preparedness program? There's like a full education thing. I've got it prepared. Cool. Yeah, no worries. Why not? Put it out. Uh, this program was by far more successful than any promotion program they previously run trying to get people to take up bug out bags to improve their preparedness, to have a personal threat model in place for environmental hazards. There's not a lick of anything in this plan that's different from all the other advice the CDC puts out, except they just frame it in terms of zombie preparedness. And you can go to the CDC website right now and pull down all of their lesson plans, all of their material. It's all still up there because it all still works. So one of the things we can appreciate as security people is one of the most mature uh, systems are the ones that provide feedback loops, that reintegrate, that uh, provide information to improve next time. I'm conscientious that I've run a little bit over time, so what I will say is that the most important parts of this are to work out who will benefit uh, and to have your time set aside to develop and rerun the event. That comes down to having an effective executive sponsor on your side, someone who's going to defend that chunk of time and defend your program and allow you to run that over and over again as you develop your, as you develop your program, as you get more mature and confident, and as you uh, win over the organization. Participant feedback is going to be your most effective and direct form of feedback early on in your incident response plan, uh, in your incident response exercise program. Pay particular attention to the kind of people or the people in your organization who aren't providing you feedback. If you see that they're quiet during those feedback cycles, make sure you, you make a note and take time to come to them later and ask them why they weren't responding. They may not have felt welcome. They may not have felt uh, like they could speak up in that environment. And these are all really important things that you need to understand in how you're framing your incident response exercises. But also, it's important because it could become a risk in when an incident does actually occur if that person doesn't have a level of understanding or they're not confident or have identified an issue that they don't want to articulate in front of everyone else. So final notes on scaling difficulty. <sighs> notes from a dungeon master here. One of the easiest ways to make things more difficult and stressful for players or for participants in an exercise is to give and take away time. If you expect someone to do something much faster, they're going to stress out and feel, feel under the pump a lot more, particularly if you don't warn them about it. But if they feel like they're very overwhelmed, feel free to give them a little bit more time to accomplish whatever you've set for them. And don't add more complex components to the exercise than are necessary. It's better to complete a number of small exercises than one large one, particularly if you're not confident or resourced in running that exercise effectively, because you need to be the governor and the coach and the counselor in some cases for how that exercise is being run. So I promised you recommended reading. Over the left are some O'Reilly books that are quite good for setting up your incident response playbooks and uh, looking at intelligence feeds. You can provide, pull your technical notes and your frameworks out of that, and that'll help you uh, set up your conversation and your assessment frameworks and maybe some of your handouts. The two books there in the middle, How to Measure Anything, are awesome for measuring all sorts of weird stuff. Um, the How to Measure Anything book talks about things like measuring customer satisfaction of symphony orchestras. So if you think your environment's weird, this book will probably give you a good idea about how to measure it. Pattern Languages is the book, if you've ever heard your developer friends talk about design patterns, this is the book about designing towns with design patterns that started off that whole thing. I'd recommend going to the library and getting it out because it's quite expensive and you'll get the idea after you've read maybe the first two dozen pages, but it is well worth a look at. And lastly, the Dungeon Master's Guide from D&D 5th Edition or pretty much any other game design book that you care to find. If you strip out all the stuff about elves and magic swords and dragons, there is excellent advice in there about how to run a group experience, how to take care of your players and participants, how to get feedback, all these sorts of things. So definitely check out some, some game design books. So there's the uh, contact details for me and what I enjoy talking about, but pretty much always happy for a yarn and a beer. Uh, thank you very much for your time, everyone. <laughs>